The MPTF Media Center presents the international premiere podcast of Mystery Theater Audibles, Black Fire, a science fiction fantasy novel written and narrated by Anthony Lawrence, directed and produced by Madeline Smith Lawrence, produced by Jennifer Clymer, sound engineered by Marcus Murrieta. Epilogue, Virgin Valley, Nevada, October 12, 8.40 a.m. I'm so fucked. Okay, okay, I said that before. But this is different. Something's changed. It's not just because I'm being smothered by heat out here in the middle of sand and sagebrush. Not because of the damage of my childhood. Not because I failed to kill the man I'd obsessed about for most of my life. Not because I left that job to somebody else. No. I'm fucked because I ran out on Jordan and Cody. Well, that's the real truth, and I'm ashamed of it. I'd convinced myself they were dead. I'd seen that wall fall on her, and I couldn't imagine that her little boy could have survived the hell that was tearing that world all apart around me. It was terrifying. And something in my head that Oren said I could control just popped me out of there in some instinctive and primal desire to survive. I would wander erratically and foolishly through the stored memories of my eternal recurrence on Earth. Not my words. They're from Jack London's only great sci-fi novel, The Star Rover, about a guy who could use some kind of self-hypnosis to send his mind out into time and space. I'd always loved reading London when I was a kid, all those stories about dogs turning into wolves and wolves turning into dogs. But the Star Rover was my favorite. The guy in the novel was in a prison in a straitjacket, and he was projecting his mind out of his pain-wracked body with the pure will to survive. I've taken a lot of pain recently, I'm hurting like hell right now, but my real straitjacket has always been just plain fear. That's right, deep down, gut-wrenching, lost in the dark fear. Yeah, maybe it was because of Father Matus and what he did to me as a child, or, or maybe it's just what all human beings have inherited. We're born feeling vulnerable because evolution shortchanged us and didn't provide us with fangs or claws or armor, any cool shit like that to protect ourselves except a brain. Yeah, we built all kinds of weapons with that brain, but we still feel frightened and vulnerable. Sometimes it makes us crazy. I think it made me crazy in that moment when calamity was breaking loose. Fear lit up something in my brain, something Oren told me all humans had the potential to use, and that I had triggered it before and could do it again. So once more, I travel through time and space. Not just my mind, but my physical body as well. Or at least I thought I did. Maybe Oren was part of something I just imagined. Maybe I was just hypnotizing myself. Anyway, survival just for the sake of survival is pretty overrated. 8.41 a.m. What good is surviving without Jordan? I knew I loved her, and that living without her wouldn't be living anymore, and yet I had left because it had come down to just surviving. Oh, it was all about me. I've been kidding myself, thinking that she's going to actually appear on the horizon, somehow materializing on her own out of the desert and the dawn mist. You see, the truth is that I I really believe what Oren had said about death not being eternal oblivion, and that she went on existing in some kind of identity survival on another plane. I believe that if Jordan and Cody had died, they still might exist. Maybe not here in this world, but someplace else, on some other cosmic patch or parallel universe. But I wasn't sure that Jordan and Cody had actually died and gone on to that great transition. I should have rushed back to find out what happened to them. But I am still here and just trying to save my own ass. 
I'm a bit scared to go back. That's the truth if I can allow myself to accept it. Oh, sure, I'd completed that impossible mission. I'd gone down into the bowels of that dark Disneyland, yanked out Daniel's teeth, and retrieved the fucking opal for Auron. That should have qualified me for anything. But somehow, in the end, I just settled for existence out here, pissing my pants on the rice grass. Then again, maybe I just needed this time here to recharge my batteries. 8.42 a.m. I still feel something way down deep inside, not in my gut, but in my heart or in my soul, something calling to me. It isn't the sound of Jordan's voice, but the essence of her. I can't explain it. Maybe there is something about love that is part of the bigger picture that nobody really understands. Certainly not me, not yet. But I am just beginning to understand it because I can feel it. Something so strong and powerful that it transcends just about everything else in life or existence. The connection. It's like that silver cord I'd read about in some book about astral projection. A connection between the living person's physical body and their soul that continues to exist even after death. Or maybe there's some kind of silver cord that exists between two people who love each other. Something so powerful it can stretch out across time and space and somehow, in life or death, link two people together. Maybe it's something that sustains communication between them like a microchip in their hearts so they can feel each other's pain and desire and draws them toward each other. I'm talking about real love, true love, the kind that defies any sort of explanation. You know it when you see it. Well, you know real love when you feel it. It's beyond words. It's just there, and it's like some great mystery that you share with only one other person. Okay, okay, maybe, maybe people do really fall in love more than once, but I'd be willing to bet that the silver cord only exists one time and with a particular person you know you'd die for without hesitation. Well, that's the way I feel about Jordan. That's why I know I've got to stop jerking around here and, and get my ass back to find her. You see, I, I can feel the essence of her and I know now in my heart and soul that she still exists, alive or dead. And I have to find her no matter what. In all of this craziness, we'd actually spent so little time together. I have to cherish whatever time I have left with her and with Cody. I know now that a silver cord stretches out between us, connects us, and I know that nothing can stop me from going back. Not even my fear, but, but go back where? My tired and tear-soaked eyes can see a hundred miles in every direction and the fucking Blackfire Resort and Casino is nowhere to be found. Not even a pile of burned lumber in the desolate desert. A smoke and fire damaged heap of junk across the dusty landscape. So even if I wanted to go back, and I do, how do I return to a place that doesn't exist anymore? If it even ever existed? Okay, I, I just have to trust my instincts. Really trust them. Maybe... For the first time in my entire life, I relaxed all the will of me and gave myself to the swaying dizziness that always eventually came to me. And when I felt myself sway out of balance backward, I closed my eyes. Those are more words I remember from the Star Rover, but they can be my words because that's what's happening. The vertigo has begun. I am falling backward, and I close my eyes. 8.43 a.m. In seconds, I open my eyes again, and yet everything still seems black. I quickly realize that I am back now among the ashes and that it all looks black because everything around me has been consumed by that dark fire. It is the crumbling ruins of the casino, plumes of dense smoke still rising slowly around me, and the acrid smell now in my nose of the damage left by the fire gases mixed with the smoldering debris. 
It's hot and, and difficult to breathe. I can see some sections of scorched structures, interior walls, melted glass, and twisted skeletal one-armed bandits. And there are the pitifully grotesque mounds of burnt human remains that are left scattered among the ashes. I can't help feeling some sense of guilt at the part I have played in bringing about all this death and destruction. But there are other things that appear to be untouched by the turbulent fire. I can see the elevator that had taken me down into the depths, its silent doors wide open. The steel sheen of it glistens as it stands alone, a huge bare block of some alloy or metal unaffected by the conflagration and no longer integrated with the building. And there is Table 18, the elaborately carved monstrosity, an ominous island which stands at the center of a sea of ash without a sign of smolder or scorch. I am stunned and my heart races as I see Jordan lying on her back, spread-eagled on the broad green surface of the massive table. There is nothing binding her, but she seems unable to talk or move her body. Only her head is tipped up slightly as she stares helplessly at me and struggles against some invisible restraints, but she appears unhurt. Just beyond the table in Jordan stands Daniel, the master motherfucker of cards, with his long, silvery hair and that same incandescent glacial smile. He is holding a deck of those antique playing cards, cutting, riffling, and dovetailing with one hand in that expertly proficient way of his. Daniel's expression is a mixture of sardonic contempt and patient anticipation of enjoyment at someone else's expense. <laughs> it doesn't take a mental giant to calculate that both Jordan and I figure into that equation. I know almost instantly why Jordan seems unable to move, because I am seized by some similar invisible paralyzing agent, something that has taken over control of my body, and I am unable to move from the spot in which I had so magically appeared. I'm frozen, as if turned to stone by the male Medusa who confronts me with a wicked smile of icicle-like white teeth that I had not long ago contained inside my pocket. So good of you to return, Rafe, he offers with the bitterness prevalent in his voice. Did you want to see the results of your betrayal? Look around. Look at what Oren has done. See the human bodies turn to ash. Oh, yes, they will transform. But their deaths were excruciatingly painful. Does that make you happy? And look at the remains of my creation. Is the destruction complete enough for you? Your creation, I blurt out, relieved that at least my vocal cords are not restricted in the same way as my body. So you are the fucking devil. Or worse, Daniel remains expressionless, revealing nothing more than he intended. <laughs> Blackfire was such an exquisite resort and casino. Such pains were taken to make it unique and unsurpassed. While other casinos around the world are designed to put visitors in a trance-like state with an absence of natural daylight and clocks to keep them lulled into continually pulling out their wallets, we made sure there were no tricks of sensory marketing, no subtle, tactile, or olfactory cues to keep gamblers happy. No pleasant scents or pheromones or extra oxygen. It was a madhouse and it needed to be destroyed. You filled our minds with bullshit. What do you want from us now? Oh, I want to make you suffer for what you've done. There is a simple but terrifying coldness in his voice that makes me wonder if I might not have taken a more conciliatory tone. I mean, at least just starting out. I don't really give a shit what he might have in store for me, but Jordan is definitely there for a reason, and her vulnerability is obvious. His movement is almost indiscernible. Just a flick of the fingers of his hand containing the playing cards. One of the cards is propelled from the deck in a flash and darts across the space between Daniel and Jordan in an instant, 
It seems to have the honed and keen edges of a razor, the speed and accuracy of a bullet, because the thin, sharp borderline swiftly slices into the flesh of Jordan's bare arm and leaves a reddening laceration before it ricochets away into the ashes on the floor. Jordan winces in pain and tries to muffle her cry of surprise. She stares down at the bleeding nick in her flesh and then back up at Daniel with growing anxiety and more than a bit of resolve and stubborn indignation. I am less contained. You fucking... Bastard, I scream at him as I desperately and fruitlessly struggle to at least retrieve my Glock from its holster. But I can't move a muscle. Spare yourself, Rage. It wouldn't work if you could get to it. I'm afraid, even in this rubble, I still have the house edge. Fuck you, fuck you! His smile is chilling and bitter. <laughs> it's amusing to see you so indignant. After all, you pulled my teeth out while I slept. You're trying to destroy humanity. Oh, you've been doing that to yourselves for centuries. Daniel is unruffled. The sardonic smile widens even further. I'm afraid you've run out of capital, Rafe. Let me, let me ask you a question. At what point do you think the gambler's chance of being ruined equals the bank's? Now, you don't have to be a mathematician. It's a simple calculation. It's when their capital is equal. Your chances in the multiverses and right here are the same. They are proportional. The game ends with the ruin of one party, and the house wins by virtue of being the house. You see, you should always play against other gamblers rather than the house. I hold all the cards in my hand and they're very powerful. In an instant, another card is ejected from the deck in his hand and flashes down toward Jordan. It slices right through her blouse and then flips away again, leaving a line of blood seeping into view through the material as she screams in pain. Her cry mingles with my own shriek of rage. Stop it! But his smile has a mischievous wickedness. Oh, he's really enjoying his little game. Have you ever heard of Ling Chi Rafe? It is an ancient Chinese practice known in the West as death by a thousand cuts. It is a form of torment imposed for a particularly serious crime to draw a lesson from the agonies of the criminal. You're a fucking maniac, I spit out venomously. Oh, of course, torment is distinguished from torture, Daniel continues calmly and obviously unaffected by my epithets and howls of dismay. As he continues talking, he darts two more of the sharp cards, one after the other at Jordan, inflicting tiny but impressive slices in her flesh. Daniel's tone becomes even more cynical and ironic. Torment aims only to cause pain. It is an interesting distinction that the Chinese and Tibetans seem to understand. What you Americans inflicted on captives in Iraq, the semi-drowning termed waterboarding is torture because the victims are compelled to disclose something. Well, I don't want Jordan to disclose anything at all. I just want her to suffer. And your torment, watching her suffer, is of great satisfaction to me. So now, Ling Chi is my capital, and I'm spending it like a high roller. I'm growing hoarse, screaming at him to stop, but he just keeps darting the cards at Jordan, ignoring her screams as well. She is trying desperately to bear the pain, but the slices he is inflicting are beginning to become agonizing, and she is sobbing despite her best efforts. Suddenly, in spite of my own distress at seeing what is happening to Jordan, I become aware of something emerging out of the thick smoke not far from where I am standing. It is a figure, like a man, but distorted and somewhat grotesque. At first, I think my eyesight is impaired because of the smoke that has brought tears to my eyes. And then I realize that what I am seeing does appear to be something that looks like Quasimodo, right out of the hunchback of Notre Dame. It is the figure of a man with what appears to be a deformed back. But as he approaches slowly, I can now see that it is not a man with a deformity, but a man carrying a small boy on his back. A boy who looks very familiar. The man is young, dressed in something that looks like a carnival costume, and he seems uncertain in his progress, as if he might even be blind. 
I can hear the small boy giving him instructions as how to proceed. It is the boy's voice that rings a bell of recognition. It is Cody. Bomb is straddling the back of the young man piggyback style as they make their way slowly and uncertainly through the smoke and ashes. They are both coughing slightly from the toxic air that fouls each breath they take. Cody has seen his mother, and I think Jordan has heard his voice as well because she is struggling to cry out, and it isn't from pain, but rather from the joy of hearing Cody's voice. Daniel has also become aware of them and glances in their direction, his brilliant smile never diminishing, and his voice remaining calm and in control. He is still talking to me. It's time to give up the opal, Rafe. I told you I don't have it. I know you don't. But Cody does. It's in his pocket. I am at a loss. I don't know how Cody obtained the jewel, and I don't know how Daniel knows he has it. But I've learned not to question any bizarre logic here, and I suspect that somehow the tables have slightly turned in our favor. Am I to understand that our capital has now become equal? I ask Daniel, struggling to maintain my composure. I'm willing to concede that, Rafe. You might even have an edge. Give up the Blackfire Opal, and I will let all of you go. You think I'd trust you? I shoot back quickly. Daniel has an answer for everything, just like Oran, but this man is far more insidious. You've already accomplished what Oran wanted to do. You've destroyed the casino. What about the ending human life as we know it thing? Daniel shrugs and grins ironically. Ever heard of Pascal's wager? Bet on God. If he exists, you win. If he doesn't, you don't lose anything. In other words, if faith actually does save your soul, there is an infinity of an infinitely happy life to gain. Well, I'm not quite sure I understand or can accept his somewhat vague religious and philosophical bullshit, but I, I don't have a hell of a lot of choices right now. Jordan is bleeding, and it won't take many more of those cards to edge her past the point of no return. If there's the slightest chance, I have to grab it. When the one you love is bleeding to death, the rest of the world can go to hell in a handbasket or some such shit like that. I yell at Cody. Cody, can you hear me? Yeah, Rafe. Who's your friend? His name's Miguel, and he saved my life. Good for him. Hey, what's going on, man? I'm blind, Miguel calls out warily, unsure of just what is happening. Hey, Miguel, I'll explain it all to you really soon. I love you for helping the boy. Just, well, hang with us for a minute, okay? You got it, says Miguel. He's a vet. I can tell blast scars when I see them. He knows crisis. He can sense it despite his blindness. I proceed cautiously. Now you listen to me, Cody. Listen very carefully. You want to save your mom? He's crying now, just looking at his mother covered with half a dozen wounds and bleeding. But he's a tough kid and he gets it out. Sure. Okay, that a boy. Do you have a small black stone in your pocket? Yes, he answers with some hesitation, not quite sure that he hasn't been caught doing something he shouldn't. Ever play ball, Cody? Sure, in school. What position? Shortstop? Ever pitch? Relief? Outstanding, kid. Outstanding. Do you think you could bean that Cheshire cat with that stone? Bean him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right square in the face. Think you could do that? Right now? It could save your mom. I, I think I could. Don't think, Cody. No thinking. I just want you to do it. Can I get down? No time, buddy. Your mom's bleeding. Gotta do it right now, you hear me? Daniel is grinning like crazy, and I figure I'm about to end all the cosmic patches in the fucking multiverses, but I just don't give a shit right now about anything but saving Jordan any more pain. Ah, that's the funny thing about love. It gets things right down to the basics. I gotta stop the hurting, that's all. Just stop it. I watch the boy as he digs into his pocket and brings out the black fire opal. That's it, Cody. Now, throw it. Throw it as close to that grinning jackass's face as you can. You can do it, buddy. You can do it. Now, go ahead. Throw it. 
He's been collecting things his whole life to fill the void left behind by his drug addict father. But now, feeling strong and secure, all Cody can think about is sending that fucking opal back to hell. The kid's a lefty, and he winds up as best he can and tosses the opal right at Daniel's head. It's a decent toss, not a great pitch, but decent, and winging very close to the leering face of the master of cards. It arcs like a rainbow, and there are tiny sparkling bursts of light and color from within the stone as it flies, like in slow motion, across the ash-covered field toward the man with the million-dollar grin. But the grin becomes something else as the stone closes in on that strange face. Daniel's lower jaw begins to slowly open like the ramp of a cargo plane, those shining teeth unlocking and revealing a mouth and throat like the entrance of a dark passage into infinity. Then, as the black fire opal passes into Daniel's mouth, the jaw snaps shut like a wolf trap, and the frozen grin returns. He swallows hard, and the opal returns once again to its secret hiding place. At that moment, I feel my body released from the invisible restraints, and I charge forward to Jordan. She seems relieved as well, and is beginning to sit up. I scoop her into my arms, and she clutches at me with the same intensity. At the same time, Cody scrambles off the shoulders of the blind Miguel and darts swiftly to his mother. She grabs him, both crying and hugging each other. Mom, Mom! I have only time to take a deep breath and glance toward where Daniel had been seconds before. Oh, he's vanished. But I hear him laughing. That's right, laughing. And I turn to look toward the sound, and I, I see him now standing inside the elevator. He's standing alone, and his laughter is not that of some maniacal arch-villain from a bad B-movie. It's a quiet laughter, only slightly tinged with a sense of triumph. But I definitely don't like the sound of it. <laughs> you needn't feel too bad, Rafe, he says in the confines of the elevator. The gaming experience is the same for all life throughout the many worlds. It is just the two pleasures for your choosing. One is winning, the other is losing. His hand comes up to his brow, and he tips his two forefingers in a salutary salute that seems to signify that he will see me again. Then the elevator door shuts slowly, enclosing him in the steel box that now proceeds to descend into the earth. Ash and stone sink and crumble beneath it, and it lowers slowly into the deep, black abyss. The sound of Daniel's cynical laughter can still be heard fading as the elevator is swallowed up and disappears. 8.50 a.m. Not long afterward, as we walk through the desert, I still struggle with my feelings of unreality. Like Pascal, I want certainty, but I have none. Am I just some pathetic loser wandering in the desert, dying of heat and thirst, and hallucinating all that has happened? Or is the real me just sitting on a chair in some mental ward, staring out a barred window, totally immersed in a haunting delusion? Or maybe I'm not even a man at all. Maybe I'm just a butterfly fluttering its wings in Brazil and dreaming I'm a man in Nevada. But can we tiny humans dancing among the multiverses ever really approach divine truth any more than the actual salvation of our eternal souls? I had brought us all here on the magic carpet of my third eye, like a group of phoenix birds out of the ashes. Yet that seemingly incredible trick is of little importance when weighed against the feel of my arm around Jordan and seeing Cody on Miguel's back directing his footsteps through the sand and rice grass as we move closer to Winnemucca. These simple human experiences are the true miracles of existence. I can only hope with all my heart that now they are real and that they are actually mine.